Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Papasissa. I'm a tile designer and a PhD researcher at the University of Reading in England. This follows on a master course at the same university which I attended in 2011. Such a program not only shapes professional type designers, but it encourages students to approach the design of scripts that are unfamiliar to them, and to teach them to design multi-scripts in an harmonious way. It should not then surprise you that I am not Armenian, but Italian. I want to thank Saitai Pai for having me here today, as well as the Calusta Gubelkamp Foundation for awarding me the short-term grant for Armenian studies to speak at this conference. Today, I would like to share with you some insight into my research topic, Armenian typefaces in the second half of the 19th century. I do not know how many of you are familiar with the Armenian script, so I will briefly introduce the script before introducing a key character of the 19th century, Janik Avramian, who had great impact on spreading the newly Bologir typeface he introduced. Finally, I'm going to present to you some of the typographic aspects that have marked the beginning of Latinization of the Armenian script. What has particularly interested me, both as a researcher and a type designer, is to understand how Armenian typefaces are designed today. When I went to Armenia in 2011, this was a graphic scene I observed in the capital, in Yerevan. Armenian letters have European influence. We can see serifs, recognized Latin letters in the middle of Armenian words, and the style looks familiar to many of us, I guess. However, I also came across handwritten sign writing, with painting letters on used canvases, though not really often. Here the style looks certainly more traditional, calligraphic, and authentic than the one we saw before. When it comes to public signage, the situation does not differ. Two variants signpost the street of Yerevan. In the first one, Armenian appears alongside the Latin, to match in forms and styles. In the second one, letters are engraved into metal plaques in the Yerkatagir style, which means iron letters, and do not differ from ancient stone inscriptions. So to explain this heterogeneous landscape, we need to go back to the middle of the 19th century. But first, let me give you some information on Armenian script. It is a very small country, just under 30,000 square kilometers. The population of Armenia is about 3 million, which is less than the population of the Mont Montreal metropolitan area. Armenian is bounded by Turkey, Ger Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Iran. But the majority of Armenians live abroad. This diaspora is about 7 million, which is less than the population in the province of Quebec. In this map, you can see that the yellow dots indicate the largest Armenian community in the US, France, Lebanon, and Russia. There are uh, therefore 10 million Armenian speakers worldwide. The Armenian language is a member of the Indo-European family and forms a standalone branch of this. The Armenian script is a left-to-right writing system. It has 38 upper and 38 lowercase letters. It uses uh, ascenders, and descenders. It has consonant and vowels, and um, it makes use of the uh, appropriate punctuation symbols. This is what the traditional Bolog style looks like. In printed, the Bolog style was used to typeset main text. The main features of these uh, type styles are 60.5 degrees slanted, sharp parallel lines and junctions, giving the script a regular, almost rigid appearance, and little contrast between vertical and horizontal strokes. 
Here is an extract to the production of a second known Armenian printer in the 16th century. Such a style continued to prevail well into the 19th century. The middle of the 19th century witnessed a major change in fashion in the Bologna typeface. We can see straight away that the new style presents obvious similarities with the Latin script. This is now known as the Aramian Simplified Typeface. The introduction of this newly fashioned Bologna typeface transported us from Armenia to Paris in the 1850s. Why? At the time, the Armenian territory was split between two empires, Tsarist Russia in the east and the Ottoman Empire in the west. For that reason, a significant number of Armenian people had emigrated. For example, there was a well-settled Armenian community in Madras, in India, around 1770. Attempts to produce nationalistic publication there did not last, as the clergy managed to maintain close control on what was published. And also the audience does not seem to have been very receptive. The 19th century was a period of active contact between Armenians and Europeans, especially from France and Italy. So a large number of Armenian students were sent to um, Europe in order to receive education. The assimilation of European revolutionary concepts and the attempt of Armenians to affirm their national identity coincided with the development of a modern Armenian language at the expense of the classical Armenian language known as Grabar. With the introduction of a modern language, Armenian publication no longer restricted their context to religion or scholarly topics, but started to feature translation of European contemporaries, mainly uh, French authors. So this is where Janik Aramian comes in. The newly fashioned Armenian typefaces first appeared in his printing establishment in Paris in the 1855. These new typefaces mark the introduction of European typographic conventions to Armenian script. Aramian had been trained in Constantinople as a tailor, had combined his apprenticeship with the practice of typesetting. In 1846, he moved to Paris, and in the 1850s, he engaged in engraving and typefounding. And finally, in 1855, he established his own publishing house. Aramian was a very active printer, publisher, as well as a writer on issues of national importance and educational matters in Paris and Constantinople. Janik Avamian introduced the newly Bologit uh, typefaces in La Colonne du Massis, the first Armenian illustrated journal printed in Paris. The journal was established in 1855, and it was printed and published by Janik Avamian in Paris until 1858. The journal was printed in modern Armenian language, and the articles intended to inform Europeans about the Armenian situation were written both in Armenian and French. So Janik Aramian made the introduction of um, his new typefaces an official matter. To this end, he chose to make an announcement in the foreword of the first issue of La Colonne du Massis. For about 100 years, Aramian was considered to be the designer of those typefaces that appeared in the journal La Colonne du Massis in Paris. As already mentioned, today's designer referred to them as Aramian simplified typefaces. This is claimed by Tudyk, the first historian of Armenian printing. However, I discovered that Aramian had not designed those typefaces, but they used typefaces designed by others. In an article published in La Colonne du Massis in 1856, Aramian stated that those types, which you can see in this slide, were not his own work. He was keen to give credit to other people. And I want to cite his words. On our part, we haven't invented anything new. All five forms of typefaces found in Massias Agavni, La Colonne du Massis, that is, those letters named Varg, Massis, Arevelk, Ani, and Arsa Louise, have been engraved and published according to the principle laid out by various individuals. Having cited the name of these typefaces, we consider it our duty to talk briefly about these respectable individuals. For my PhD, I have analyzed the typefaces displayed in this image and compare them to the traditional Bologna style. For this presentation, I'm only pointing out the main features 
of this new Bologi type style, the significant difference between the new and the old traditional style. Originally, both in manuscript and printing, Armenian letters designed in the Bologi style were drawn at an angle of 60.5 degrees following the rules of contrast and ductus produced by the use of an ipen. In 1855, the typhus named Varg, designed by the Reverend Vardopet Gabriel Ivavoski, who was also the editor of the journal, was drawn following the model of Latin Roman typefaces by adopting a vertical axis. The so-called classical types typed by the Didot in France in the early 19th century, types with light strokes in greater contrast to heavy strokes and condensed type form to make letters appear taller and narrower, were predominant in France and soon became widespread throughout Europe. The new Armenian typefaces used by Janik Karamian in his printed works were shaped following this French model. The shift from slanted to upright forced designers to change the proportion between ascendants, base character height, and descendants of Armenian typefaces. So the version one on one on one, so ascended base character height and descendants, typical of a traditional uh, Armenian typefaces, was modified to increase uh, the base character height to make the typeface closer and fitting to the X height of the Latin. Just in order to modify the dimension of the base character height, ascenders and descenders were shortened in order to maintain the same body. The second Armenian typeface, published in La Colonne du Massis, the Armenian service type Massis, was drawn to emulate the dot typefaces, particularly the predominant contrast between ascendants and descending strokes. Massis was cut at 10 point size by the printer and type founder Jovanes Mohendisian in Constantinople and further improved by Vavoski, who, as I said, was the editor of the journal. The type has a high contrast between strokes and thin serifs attached to the end of the strokes of letters, like in Latin, uh, on both sides. But serifs were not the only feature used to strengthen the link between the Armenian and the Latin script. For example, the tail of letters you see here displayed and marked by the blue circles was reduced and turned into bulbous terminals, marked in this image by the red circles. Vark, which did not adopt serifs, was already using bulbous terminals, both on sun tail letters and on the extension of upper and lower extremities of a number of other letters. So it appears that Janik Ramiam, Mohendisian, and Iva Voski did not fully understand how stylistic details were applied to Latin letters, and they paid more attention to the external factors than to the construction of Armenian letters. New letters from word design and issues such as functionality of the script and recognizability of letter shapes were progressively raised. The use of bulbous terminals in place of horizontal tails created confusion between letters such as za and gim, gad and da, and ven ken that had similar shapes. And to complicate the issue, the termination on the right side of the letter um, gim and the letter da was shortened. The connection with the Dido style was strengthened by the increase in stroke contrast in the Armenian script and particularly by the changes in proportion, which allowed the use of sword from the Latin Dido. Superposition of Armenian Vo from one of the typefaces shown early and the Latin letter N shows that the two letters are an exact match. Just Armenian letters were substituted with Latin swords that presented similar aesthetic features. So letter S was introduced to be used instead of teen. Um, the letter F replaced K, which is this one, due to some affinity in their design. Cases of phonetic correspondence between Armenian and Latin scripts were extremely rare. 
This explains why Armenian letters Re was the only one to be replaced by its corresponding Latin letter R. The outcome of a sequence of alterations to the Armenian script introduced by Latinization can be summed up along the following lines. The process was very extensive. Hardly any letter of the traditional script was left untouched. The influence of the Latin script was significant, not only in the case of shape similarities, but also in the substitution of Latin letters when there was phonetic correspondence. It must be said that such a reform did not take place in a context of technological change. One needs to emphasize the significance of the first Armenian printing establishment in Paris in the 1850s, and of Aramian's role in promoting new typefaces for Armenian language to wider purposes than traditional printing for religious books. The successive revision of letter shapes carried out under his direction during the process of the production of new Armenian typefaces allowed for a number of alternate versions of letter forms. The changes in the Armenian script introduced by Avramian were not my fine-turning of stylistic features. On the contrary, they had great impact on the production of subsequent Armenian typefaces. On the other hand, it is perhaps significant that despite the major changes undergoing by Armenian script, the traditional Slante style has never been abandoned. The fear provoked by the introduction of new Armenian typefaces and the new language, both emulating European aspects, arose from Armenians who believed that departing from their tradition and from the past would have put at risk their identity, traditions, and values. A lengthy letter published in the French journal Paris in 1861 provides evidence of this fear. To finish, I would like to put on my type designer's heart. Of course, clarity and legibility are paramount when designing a typeface. Aesthetic consideration will inevitably influence choices. Technology is no longer a limiting factor in type design. However, there are other aspects that might be taken into account. In our 21st century, in a context of a country with a large diaspora, identity can be extremely important. The heterogeneous Armenian typographic landscape, showing both traditional and modern outcomes, is proof that Aramian's um, heritage is as well rooted in the Armenian culture as the traditional style. We have seen that Latinization was conditioned by the cultural environment of the time. Now, by observing the Armenian typefaces on the market, produced by designers living inside and outside Armenia, the impression is that Armenians who live in Armenia want to feel close to the Western world, where those of the diaspora are keen to preserve its own identity, preferring to maintain the features of the writing style representative of the manuscript tradition. There is therefore a need to strike the right balance between tradition and modernity without losing the best of Armenians' rich and long-standing heritage. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I forgot to... Thank you.